My Life with the Chimpanzees by Jane Goodall July 16, 1960, was a day I shall remember all my life. It was when I first set foot on the shingle and sand beach of Chimpanzee Land, that is, Gombe National Park. I was 26 years old. Mum and I were greeted by the two African Game Scouts who were responsible for protecting the 30 square miles of the park. They helped us to find a place where we could put up our old ex-army tent. We chose a lovely spot under some shady trees near the small, fast-flowing Kakombe stream. In Kagoma, before setting out, we had found a cook, Dominic. He put up his little tent some distance from ours and quite near the lake. When camp was ready, I set off to explore. It was already late afternoon, so I could not go far. There had been a grass fire not long before, so all the vegetation of the more open ridges and peaks had burned away. This made it quite easy to move around, except that the slopes above the valley were very steep in places, and I slipped several times on the loose, gravelly soil. I shall never forget the thrill of that first exploration. Soon after leaving camp, I met a troop of baboons. They were afraid of the strange, white-skinned creature, that was I, and gave their barking alarm call, Wahoo! Wahoo! Again and again. I left them, hoping that they would become used to me soon. Otherwise, I thought, all the creatures of Gombe would be frightened. As I crossed a narrow ravine, crowded with low trees and bushes, I got very close to a beautiful red-gold bushbuck, a forest antelope, about the size of a long-legged goat. I knew it was female because she had no horns. When she scented me, she kept quite still for a moment and stared toward me with her big, dark eyes. Then, with a loud barking call, she turned and bounded away. When I got to one of the high ridges, I looked down into the valley. There, the forest was dark and thick. That was where I planned to go the next day to look for chimpanzees. When I got back to camp, it was dusk. Dominic had made a fire and was cooking our supper. That evening, and for the next four days, we had fresh food from Kigoma, but after that we ate out of cans. Lewis had not managed to find very much money for our expedition, so our possessions were few and simple. A knife, fork, and spoon each, a couple of tin plates and tin mugs. But that was all we needed. After supper, Mum and I talked around our campfire, then snuggled into our two cots in the tent. Early the next morning, I set out to search for chimpanzees. I had been told by the British game ranger in charge of Gombe not to travel about the mountains by myself, except near camp. Otherwise, I had to take one of the game scouts with me. So I set off with Adolf. That first day, we saw two chimps feeding in a tall tree. As soon as they saw us, they leapt down and vanished. The next day, we saw no chimps at all, nor the day after nor the day after that. A whole week went by before we found a very big tree full of tiny round red fruits that Adolf told me were called Msalula. From the other side of the valley, we could watch chimps arriving at the tree, feeding, then climbing down and vanishing into the forest. I decided to camp in the best viewing site so that I could see them first thing in the morning. I spent three days in that valley and I saw a lot of chimps, but they were too far away and the foliage of the tree was too thick. It was disappointing and frustrating, and I didn't have much to tell Mum when I got back. There was another problem that I had to cope with. Adolf was very lazy. He was almost always late in the morning. I decided to try another man, Rashidi. He was far better and helped me a lot, showing me the trails through the forests and the best ways to move from one valley to the next. He had sharp eyes and spotted chimps from far away. But even after several months, the chimps had not become used to us. They ran off if we got anywhere near to them. I begged the game ranger to let me move about the forest by myself. I promised that I would always tell Rashidi in which direction I was going, so that he would know where to look for me if I failed to turn up in the evening. The game ranger finally gave in. At last, I could make friends with the chimpanzees in my own way. Every morning, I got up when I heard the alarm clock at 5.30 a.m. I ate a couple of slices of bread and had a cup of coffee from the thermos flask. Then I set off, climbing to where I thought the chimps might be. 
Most often, I went to the peak. I discovered that from this high place, I had a splendid view in all directions. I could see chimps moving in the trees, and I could hear if they called. At first, I watched from afar through my binoculars and never tried to get close. I knew that if I did, the chimps would run silently away. Gradually, I began to learn about the chimps' home and how they lived. I discovered that most of the time, the chimps wandered about in small groups of six or less, not in a big troop like the baboons. Often, a little group was made up of a mother with her children, or two or three adult males by themselves. Sometimes, many groups joined together, especially when there was delicious ripe fruit on one big tree. When the chimps got together like that, they were very excited. Made a lot of noise and were easy to find. Eventually, I realized that the chimps I watched from the peak were all part of one group, a community. There were about fifty chimps belonging to this community. They made use of three of the valleys to the north of the Kakombe Valley, where our tent was, and two valleys to the south. These valleys have lovely sounding names: Kasakela, Linda, and Rutonga in the north, Makinke, and Nyasanga in the south. From the peak, I noted which trees the chimps were feeding in, and then, when they had gone, I scrambled down and collected some of the leaves, flowers, or fruits so they could be identified later. I found that the chimps eat mostly fruits, but also a good many kinds of leaves, blossoms, seeds, and stems. Later, I would discover that they eat a variety of insects and sometimes hunt and kill prey animals to feed on meat. During those months of gradual discovery, the chimps very slowly began to realize that I was not so frightening after all. Even so, it was almost a year before I could approach to within one hundred yards, and that is not really very close. The baboons got used to me much more quickly. Indeed, they became a nuisance around our camp by grabbing any food that we accidentally left lying on the table. I began to learn more about the other creatures that shared the forests with the chimpanzees. There were four kinds of monkeys in addition to the baboons, and many smaller animals such as squirrels and mongooses. There was also a whole variety of nocturnal, nighttime creatures: porcupines and civets, creatures looking rather like raccoons, and all manners of rats and mice. Only a very few animals in the forests at Gombe were potentially dangerous. Mainly buffalo and leopards, bush pigs can be dangerous too, but only if you threaten them or they're young. And of course, there are poisonous snakes, seven different kinds. Once, as I arrived on the peak in the early morning before it was properly light, I saw the dark shape of a large animal looming in front of me. I stood quite still. My heart began to beat fast, for I realized it was a buffalo. Many hunters fear buffalo more than lions or elephants. By a lucky chance, the wind was blowing from him to me, so he couldn't smell me. He was peacefully gazing in the opposite direction and chewing his cud. He hadn't heard my approach. Always, I try to move as quietly as I can in the bush. So, though I was only ten yards from him, he had no idea I was there. Very slowly, I retreated. Another time. As I was sitting on the peak, I heard a strange mewing sound. I looked around, and there, about fifteen yards away, a leopard was approaching. I could just see the black and white tip of its tail above the tall grass. It was walking along the little trail that led directly to where I sat. Leopards are not usually dangerous unless they have been wounded, but I was frightened of them in those days. Probably as a result of my experience with the leopard and the wolfhound two years before, and so very silently I moved away and looked for chimps in another valley. Later, I went back to the peak. I found that, just like any cat, that leopard had been very curious. There, in the exact place where I had been sitting, he had left his mark, his droppings. Most of the time, though, nothing more alarming than insects disturbed my vigils on the peak. It began to feel like home. I carried a little tin trunk up there. In it, I kept a kettle, some sugar and coffee, and a tin mug. Then, when I got tired from a long trek to another valley, I could make a drink in the middle of the day. I kept a blanket up there too, and when the chimps slept near the peak, I slept there.
so that I could be close by in the morning. I loved to be up there at night, especially when there was a moon. If I heard the coughing grunt of a leopard, I just prayed and pulled the blanket over my head. Chimps sleep all night, just as we do. From the peak, I often watched how they made their nests or beds. First, the chimp bent a branch down over some solid foundation, such as a fork or two parallel branches. <coughs> Holding it in place with his feet, he then bent another over it. Then he folded the end of the first branch back over the second, and so on. He often ended up by picking lots of small, soft, leafy twigs to make a pillow. Chimps like their comfort. I've learned over the years that infants sleep in their nest with their mothers until they are about five years old, or until the next baby is born and the older child has to make its own bed. I never returned to camp before sunset, but even when I slept on the peak, I first went down to have supper with Mum and tell her what I had seen that day, and she would tell me what she had been doing. Mum set up a clinic. She handed out medicine to any of the local Africans, mostly fishermen. Who were sick? Once she cured an old man who was very ill indeed. Word about this cure spread far and wide, and sometimes patients would walk for miles to get treatment from the wonderful white woman doctor. Her clinic was very good for me. It meant that the local people realized we wanted to help. When Mum had to go back to England after four months to manage things at home, the Africans wanted, in turn, to help me. Of course. Mum worried about leaving me on my own. Dominic was a wonderful cook and great company. He was not really reliable, so Louis Leakey asked Tassan to come all the way from Lake Victoria to help with the boat and engine. It was lovely to see his handsome, smiling face again, and his arrival relieved Mum's mind no end. Of course, I missed her after she'd gone, but I didn't have time to be lonely. There was so much to do. Soon after she'd left. I got back one evening and was greeted by an excited Dominic. He told me that a big male chimp had spent an hour feeding on the fruit of one of the oil nut palms growing in the camp clearing. Afterward, he had climbed down, gone over to my tent, and taken the bananas that had just been put there for my supper. This was fantastic news. For months, the chimps had been running off when they saw me. Now one had actually visited my camp. Perhaps he would come again. The next day, I waited in case he did. What a luxury to lie in until seven a.m. As the hours went by, I began to fear that the chimp wouldn't come. But finally, at about four in the afternoon, I heard a rustling in the undergrowth opposite my tent, and a black shape appeared on the other side of the clearing. I recognized him at once. It was the handsome male with the dense white beard. I had already named him David Greybeard. Quite calmly, he climbed into the palm and feasted on its nuts, and then he helped himself to the bananas I had set out for him. <coughs> There were ripe palm nuts on that tree for another five days, and David Greybeard visited three more times and got lots of bananas. A month later, when another palm tree in camp bore ripe fruit, David again visited us, and on one of those occasions, he actually took a banana from my hand. I could hardly believe it. From that time on, things got easier for me. Sometimes, when I met David Greybeard out in the forest, he would come up to see if I had a banana hidden in my pocket. The other chimps stared with amazement. Obviously, I wasn't as dangerous as they had thought. Gradually, they allowed me closer and closer. It was David Greybeard who provided me with my most exciting observation. One morning, near the peak, I came upon him squatting on a termite mound. As I watched, he picked a blade of grass, poked it into a tunnel in the mound, and then withdrew it. The grass was covered with termites, all clinging on with their jaws. He picked them off with his lips and scrunched them up. Then he fished for more. When his piece of grass got bent, he dropped it, picked up a little twig, stripped the leaves off it, and used that. I was really thrilled. David had used objects as tools. He had also changed a twig into something more suitable for fishing termites. He had actually made a tool. Before this observation, scientists had thought that only humans could make tools. Later, I would learn that chimpanzees use more objects as tools than any creature except for us. 
This finding excited Louis Leakey more than any other. In October, the dry season ended, and it began to rain. Soon the golden mountain slopes were covered with lush green grass. Flowers appeared, and the air smelled lovely. Most days it rained just a little. Sometimes there was a downpour. I loved being out in the forest in the rain. And I loved the cool evenings when I could lace the tent shut and make it cozy inside with a storm lantern. The only trouble was that everything got damp and grew mold. Scorpions and giant poisonous centipedes sometimes appeared in the tent, even a few times a snake. But I was lucky. I never got stung or bitten. The chimpanzees often seem miserable in the rain. They looked cold and they shivered. Since they were clever enough to use tools, I was surprised that they had not learned to make shelters. Many of them got coughs and colds. Often, during heavy rain, they seemed irritable and bad-tempered. Once, as I walked through thick forest in a downpour, I suddenly saw a chimp hunched in front of me. Quickly, I stopped. Then I heard a sound from above. I looked up, and there was a big chimp there, too. When he saw me, he gave a loud, clear wailing, Rah! A spine-chilling call that is used to threaten a dangerous animal. To my right, I saw a large black hand shaking a branch and bright eyes glaring threateningly through the foliage. Then came another savage raw from behind. Up above, the big male began to sway the vegetation. I was surrounded. I crouched down, trying to appear as non-threatening as possible. Suddenly a chimp charged straight toward me. His hair bristled with rage. At the last minute, he swerved and ran off. I stayed still. Two more chimps charged nearby. Then suddenly, I realized I was alone again. All the chimps had gone. Only then did I realize how frightened I had been. When I stood up, my legs were trembling. Male chimps, although they are only four feet tall when upright, are at least three times stronger than a grown man. And I weighed only about 90 pounds. I had become very thin with so much climbing in the mountains and only one meal a day. That incident took place soon after the chimps had lost their initial terror of me, but before they had learned to accept me calmly as part of their forest world. If David Greybeard had been among them, they probably would not have behaved like that, I thought. After my long days in the forest, I looked forward to supper. Dominic always had it ready for me when I got back in the evenings. Once a month, he went into Kagoma with Hassan. They came back with new supplies including fresh vegetables and fruit and eggs. And they brought my mail. That was something I really looked forward to. After supper, I would get out the little notebook in which I had scribbled everything I had seen while watching the chimps during the day. I would settle down to write it all legibly into my journal. It was very important to do that every evening while it was all fresh in my mind. Even on days when I climbed back to sleep near the chimps, I always wrote up my journal first. Gradually, as the weeks went by, I began to recognize more and more chimpanzees as individuals. Some, like Goliath, William, and Old Flo, I got to know well, because David Greybeard sometimes brought them with him when he visited camp. I always had a supply of bananas ready in case the chimps arrived. Once you have been close to chimps for a while, they are as easy to tell apart as your classmates. Their faces look different and they have different characters. David Greybeard, for example, was a calm chimp who liked to keep out of trouble, but he was also very determined to get his own way. If he arrived in camp and couldn't find any bananas, he would walk into my tent and search. Afterward, all was chaos. It looked as though some burglar had raided the place. Goliath had a much more excitable, impetuous temperament. William, with his long-shaped face, was shy and timid. Old Flo was easy to identify. She had a bulbous nose and ragged ears. She came to camp with her infant daughter, whom I named Fifi, and her juvenile son, Fegan. Sometimes adolescent Fabin came too. It was from Flo that I first learned that in the wild, female chimps have only one baby every five or six years. The older offspring, even after they have become independent, still spend a lot of time with their mothers, and all the different family members help one another. Flo also taught me that female chimps 
do not have just one mate. One day she came to my camp with a pink swelling on her rump. This was a sign that she was ready for mating. She was followed by a long line of suitors. Many of them had never visited my camp before, and they were scared. But they were so attracted to Flo that they overcame their fear in order to keep close to her. She allowed them all to mate with her at different times. Soon after the chimps had begun to visit my camp, the National Geographic Society, which was giving Lewis money for my research, sent a photographer to Gombe to make a film. Hugo van Lawick was a Dutch baron. He loved and respected animals just as I did, and he made a wonderful movie. One year later, in England, we got married. By then, I had left Gombe for a while to start my own studies at Cambridge University. I hated to leave, but I knew I would soon be back. I had promised Lewis that I would work hard and get my PhD degree. After I got the degree, Hugo and I went back to Gombe together. It was a very exciting time, as Flo had just had a baby, little Flint. That was the first wild chimpanzee infant that I ever saw close up, nearly four years after I had begun my research. Flo came very often to camp looking for bananas. Fifi, now six years old, and Fegan, five years older, were still always with her. Fifi loved her new baby brother. When he was four months old, she was allowed to play with and groom him. Sometimes Flo let her carry him when they moved through the forest. During that time, Fifi learned a lot about how to be a good mother. Flint learned to walk and climb when he was six months old, and he learned to ride on his mother's back during travel instead of always clinging on underneath. He gradually spent more time playing with his two older brothers. They were always very gentle with him. So were other youngsters of the community. They had to be. For if Flo thought any other chimps were too rough, she would charge over and threaten or even attack them. I watched how Flint gradually learned to use more and more of the different calls and gestures that chimpanzees use to communicate with each other. Some of these gestures are just like ours, holding hands, embracing, kissing, patting one another on the back. They mean about the same, too. And although they do not make up a language the way human words do, all the different calls do help the chimpanzees know what is happening, even if they are far away when they hear the sounds. Each call, there are at least 30, perhaps more, means something different. Flo was the top-ranked female of her community and could dominate all the others. But she could not boss any of the males. In chimpanzee society, males are the dominant sex. Among the males themselves, there is a social order, and one male at the top is the boss. The first top-ranking male I knew was Goliath. Then, in 1964, Mike took over. He did this by using his brain. He would gather up one or two empty kerosene cans from my camp and hit and kick them ahead of him as he charged toward a group of adult males. It was a spectacular performance and made a lot of noise. The other chimps fled. So Mike didn't need to fight to get to the top, which was just as well, as he was a very small chimp. He was top male for six years. The adult males spend a lot of time in each other's company. They often patrol the boundaries of their territory and may attack chimpanzees of different communities if they meet. These conflicts are very brutal, and the victim may die. Only young females can move from one community to another without being hurt. In fact, the big males sometimes go out looking for such females and try to take them back into their own territory. As the months went by, I learned more and more. I recorded more and more details when I watched the chimpanzees. Instead of writing the information in notebooks, I started to use a little tape recorder. Then I could keep my eyes on the chimps all the time. By the end of each day, there was so much typing to be done that I found I couldn't do it all myself. I needed an assistant to help. Soon, with even more chimps coming to camp, I needed other people to help with the observations. There were always more fascinating things to watch and record, more people to help write everything down. What had started as a little camp for Mum and me ended up, six years later, as a research center, where students could come and collect information for their degrees. I was the director, 